Well, welcome everybody to another Nexus webinar. I'm so excited to uh, invite um, and have my friend Peyton Jones. Uh, Peyton is a serial church planter. He has uh, been, been in bivocational ministry, been uh, doing so many different things, helped start a new breed church planting network and um, is just doing a ton of incredible work. Most recently has, has written, authored the book, um, Church Plantology, just the art and science of planting churches and walking through uh, biblical and historical and, and just practical processes that actually bring about church planting. So Peyton, thank you so much for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Good to be here. Well, I appreciate you um, just taking some time. Um, if you would, just kind of give us a, a little bit of a background of, of you, your life and ministry. I know you went from, from mega church to out of ministry to planting churches and all the things. If you could just give us a quick snapshot, I'd love to hear some of that. Yeah, I started off in uh, Huntington Beach, California, at a mega church called Refuge. And when I was on staff there, I was actually next in line to be the pastor and felt that God said, hey, it's not for you. So I felt interrupted from the natural and normal career path, not realizing that I was going to be a missionary, but others kept seeing it and kept saying it. And eventually, uh, my wife and I, um, when we got married, uh, which is right around that time, um, she had a real bug for mission. In fact, she thought she'd be in Thailand, uh, helping uh, rescue children out of trafficking. And she worked with a woman who was there who um, founded orphanages and she had five of them running. So my wife really thought she'd end up there. Well, fast forward, um, I start making a move to go to the mission field to Wales, UK. I end up at Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones's church as the evangelist. 9-11 hits, my support drops in half. I end up working in a factory. Um, I then take a church in West Wales. I hadn't had a pastor for 20 years, it was known as the dark spot of Wales. And then um, the, that situation went south. I tried to quit ministry, but you know how that works. You try to quit ministry and God just laughs at you. Ended up a barista in a Starbucks, um, finishing up an MA in theology. Accidentally planted a church out of that Starbucks, got the church planning bug, started training church planners. And that was back in 2005 and six. And I have been, planting and training church planners ever since, uh, here, there, and everywhere, back in the States uh, at the end of 2010, and uh, have just been all over getting ready to church plant. Actually, uh, I'll meet with core teams tonight for the first time. Awesome. Where, where are you currently at right now? I'm in San Diego. Oh, nice, man. Great. Yeah, my last church plant was Long Beach, so. Okay. Yeah, a little bit different. That's awesome, dude. Um, yeah, so stint in, in Wales of all places. Uh, so you were a barista in Wales, is that correct? I was briefly. I mean, I was a great many things. I was a clinical troubleshooter, a firefighter, paramedic, uh, Starbucks barista, factory worker. I had many different jobs. I was bivocational wow. the entire time. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, in our conversation, I'd love to hear more about just, uh, just some of your process and what that looks like. Um, before we dive too farther, uh, I, I'd love to hear just kind of the, the genesis of what this is. So Church Plantology came out last year, correct? And um, just some of the, the what, what caused you to, to go into that type of a project? Yeah, I think um, it was really interesting. I blame Zondervan because uh, my acquisition editor who was the editor for my last book, um, Reaching the Unreached, Becoming Raiders of the Lost Art. Um, that book, actually, I, I told stories, but I told stories of inadequacy and the importance of relying on the Spirit's power because we were, we were planting a church in urban Long Beach that was seeing people from the LGBTQ community coming to faith. We were seeing prostitutes leave the sex trade, ex-cons, um, coming to faith, baptizing people next to the, you know, Mexican mafia and, you know, uh, M13 next to, and I'm not exaggerating, next to people from the Aryan Brotherhood. And so it was, it was a crazy rough church. And I was really tempted, like, in fact, I had a sleepless night one night because the, the acquisitions editor kept saying, you have stories. I know your stories. And I don't like to tell the stories that make Peyton look like this great legend. 
So I said, you know, I'll write the book that you want, but I'm going to tell it from like the other side, like what it feels like to be that person, what it what it feels like. Well, anyways, fast forward um, to a knock on the door from Zondervan again, where they said, hey, we've got Tim Keller Center Church, but we need a book to go alongside of it because Tim Tim Keller's book is an urban uh, it's kind of a manifesto of urban ministry and they said we need a brass tax church planning book and believe it or not Andrew I said no I said I, I don't think I'm the guy to write that for you and here's why you need a book that's going to sell right this is a business at the end of the day and people aren't going to like what I have to say because I start churches free um I I, I launch them small and they reach the unreached and I don't think there's a much of a market for that. I think it's why we all go into ministry at the beginning. And he listened to me and he said, no, Peyton, I think that's exactly the type of book that we want to publish right now. So I blame them, but I also give them credit because that book was largely um, the integrity and faith of Zondervan to say, hey, we know this isn't going to be like, you know, what people want to hear. It's what they need to hear. Yeah, yeah. Interest, especially for uh, this this time and time and place that we're in in the church post post COVID and everything like that. Right, I wrote it during COVID, which was funny. Um, but it it literally uh, it's written from that mindset. Even my first book, book which was called Church Zero, I actually say in that book because it's from a European postmodern context. I said, hey, if this book doesn't make sense, you know, give it five or ten years, and it will who knew COVID was right around the corner? I mean, that, that seemed in hindsight now, it seems somewhat prophetic because I knew when I wrote church zero, like people weren't ready for it, but this is the book. That's kind of like the brass tacks, right? How do I plant a church like the apostles did today? Right. Right. No, that's, that's awesome, man. And I, you know, just diving right into it. I mean, you feel, you feel the tension immediately in um, what you call the, the difference between church starting and church planting. And um, that's that's been one of those things that in, in, in our network, and I know that many others, you know, that there's you know, always this phrase that kind of goes out. I don't even know who's it, who it's attributed to anymore. But, um, you know, just you can if you start a church, you may or may not get disciples. But if you make disciples, you always get the church. Um, Ralph Moore. That's yeah. who I know said it. Yeah, Ralph Moore. And I've, I've heard other guys, but I, you know, originality is just forgetting the source. As, as yeah, a, that's true. Heard, that's so. true. <laughs> the difference, the difference is that Ralph Moore lives it. I mean, he's been a practitioner Yeah. and I'll always attribute a statement if it's in question to the guy actually doing it. Cause I think most likely practitioners, they're the ones that create good missiology. For sure. For sure. Yeah. We've actually had Ralph Moore on, uh, before come and train some Aww, of your guys. That was, he's my was buddy. Awesome. Um, if you would just kind of di dive into what that tension is, just the uh, uh, kind of present the problem to us and, and talk about the difference between church starting and church. <clears throat> I think the church starting uh, starts with the wrong premise. It, it starts with needing to validate itself. It's cart before the horse. So a church starts says, hey, we want to reach critical mass and we want to ensure that we as the church survive. So it's not about mission, it's about crowds. And if you remember Jesus, uh, he got rid of crowds um, pretty quick. And I'm not anti-size, I'm not anti-big church. I remind people that the Holy Spirit dropped a bomb at Pentecost and thousands of people got saved. And then a couple of days later, thousands got saved again. They had a big problem um, on their hands and that's why deacons were invented. Um, it was a size issue. It was a capacity issue. And that's a good problem to have, no doubt. But mission was at the forefront, right, of everything those guys did. So, uh, but what we often do is we, we, we're not thinking mission. We're just thinking, uh, you know, maybe like the planner thinks, I need a church plant uh, or, or I need to sustain myself. I need a paycheck. So if I plant this church and I reach critical mass, there's enough money coming into the offering to, to support me right, to keep the machine going. I'm not sure the world needs another self-focused, self-interested church, but what I do think the world needs is a church that starts with mission and says, what, what does such and such community need? How can we go on mission for Jesus? How can we reach those people? So the way in the book that I contrast is, you know, a church start because a church, church starts, it, it starts 
um, with a sexy church name, a flashy church logo, a fancy church website. Um, and then, uh, like I said, they, they start gathering crowds and everything's all about the crowd and run the show. And that's a church start. And lots of people are doing that. And the New Testament knows nothing about that. In fact, the three years Jesus trained the 12, he never said, hey, guys, now I'm going to teach you how to gather crowd and how to, he taught them the opposite. He sends them out in the little village in the hamlets. He modeled it himself very different. And then um, church planting, enter Paul now, right? Paul goes and really becomes the church planter. Um, he sows the seed of the gospel. He waters with discipleship and he um, reaps a harvest when that's fruitful. If it's not, he dusts off his feet and he goes to the next town and he does it again. So it's basically starting with the gospel, planting it into the soil of people's hearts and boom, watering with discipleship. And then you have a church um, when that's been successful. The church plant earns its right to exist because you've done the real work of the ministry. Now I could talk about that all day. I know the, the New Testament goes to great lengths to show how that was done, how the West was won in the Mediterranean in the first century, but that's the name of the game in the Bible. And so I would love for us, and this is kind of the, that's why church plantology starts at the beginning, is to recover the way of church planting uh, in, the, in the spirit and power of the apostles. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's really good stuff. And I, like I said, just, um was was some of the some of the things were very convicting i think just reading through some of that stuff just because we have that mindset sometimes and it's really easy to get planting churches or starting church services just because we know how to do it really really well yeah I mean, you know i mean we just just have your have a great band have a great welcome team and great things and signage and all the all the stuff good teacher good band good sunday school those three things that's the the three point step and but again, what you often get is Christians that, you know, are cheesed off and don't think their church is all that anymore. And they do the shuffle, you know, they, they come on over to yours and yours is the cool church for a bit. And then that wears off when the next cool church down the road comes and has better advertising and marketing. Um, and that's that's again as a part of, uh, you know, church starting is all the marketing and advertising, which I'm not opposed to. I ran church planner uh podcast for eight years my co-host was a marketer but he he would say having been a part of my last church plant he would say oh man marketing could never have accomplished this the life change that we saw and the stuff the people we engaged and we were front lines it was a very frontline church and uh and i think people they, they've forgotten the difference we swap one out for the other we've replaced evangelism with marketing We've replaced, like we've swapped out so many valuable things to the point where I, I often argue that when a seminary student, I'm a big fan of seminary, um, I, people knock it a lot, but I, I love my time there and I'm a, I'm a big fan, but, um, but often when people come out of seminary, um, they don't know how to do anything that you read about in the book of Acts. That's kind of a problem. Yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> Sorry, you you didn't get me on here to not be provocative, right? Yeah, no, please. Yes. <laughs> That's good. Um, so you so you mentioned that you're you know bivocational and kind of moving into that that co-vocational type of ministry. You also said that you're you you start churches for free. Like when you go plant churches, like you do it for free based on <clears throat> what what it costs in dollars and and cents and that type of stuff. What, is, what does that look like in leadership um, for church planters? Because yeah. we've, we've actually had an opportunity to, to launch several churches bivocationally, co-vocationally, and um, some some pastors having to have the need to go bivocational because their church wasn't large enough to support them financially or or different things. Just, just talking through some of that tension and some of your experiences. Yeah, it's really funny because I, I don't see um, the bivocational option as second best i i often will say you know i'm always going to plant bivocationally um first choice for multiple reasons one of them is because um i don't tie my personal finances to the success of the church right so when when a planter can't um sustain themselves planting they often that will be the goal 
if I could just sustain, if I could just leave my day job, that, I mean, that's not why God had you plant a church. It's not why Paul did it, right? Paul worked with his hands. If you staple the, 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 your personal finances to the mission of the church and the mission changes. So if the mission is really to reach people and reach the down and out, reach the, you know, like Jesus said, um, there's a kingdom ethic, right? He said, when you throw a banquet, don't throw it for those who can repay you, right? He's saying, don't have an ROI uh, mindset. Oh, there's a growing part of this community over here and it's growing. It's the most upwardly mobile and, and the rise, right away, all the other plans go ching, ching, ching. Wow, that's the place where money just walks around, man. I got to go there. It pays to be a planner there. And then they just try to get all these rich people in the door. Well, you know, um, here's, a, here's the best kept secret. Um, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's Samaria part. That's where the rubber hits the road. Those are the marginalized. Um, the marginalized flock to Jesus. The Pharisees got annoyed by it. But um, Jesus said, hey, kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And, and the violent take it by force. Um, he's saying that, that the marginalized are down. They're going to come running to it. If you go after the marginalized in your church plan, they can't pay you. Jesus said, you throw that banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, and your father who sees in heaven will bless you himself. He will bless uh, your banquet. He will bless what you're doing. And that's, for me, uh, it's frustrating over the years as I've watched church planners talk about their church plant failing, what really failed was their personal finances. The church was doing fine. The church was doing what it was supposed to do. Um, they might have had 20, 30, 40 people in that church. Um, and it was going well, but because their finances was the goal and they could never quite reach our goal, it was a problem. Now, I will say, uh, when you church plant bivocationally, you also cannot do it solo. So one of the things that church plantology really doubles down on is the concept of team planting that Paul did. So the first thing Jesus does in his public ministry, he goes up on a mountain, he prays, and then he gathers 12, right? He gathers his team. Um, Paul, I have a whole chapter on there called Paul's Learning Curve. It talks about Paul failing forward. You can look at his three missionary journeys and see where he failed and where he learned and changed things up on the next missionary journey, which is a fascinating study and doesn't really get talked about. And so uh, in that chapter, I just talk about, again, Paul's blunders all had to do with team. And so there's a big theology of team leadership and team planting, um, which you don't mind, I'll give a plug for my podcast, which is yeah. the team leadership podcast, because we feel this is such a hole in our uh, missiological praxis that it needs to be plugged. And so that podcast is there to kind of help people get the how, because sometimes people go, oh, I get it. I get the what. Now, how do I do it? So it's a very practical thing. But yeah, I, I think if you're going to be bivocational, you have to plant as a team because there's no way you could be bivocational and successfully uh, fulfill the duties of your ministry, as Paul charges Timothy. Yeah. What is what does that look like practically when you're so so if you go out and you launch as a team, so you've gathered people that complement your your giftings and your strengths and things like that. When you get on the ground and, and you start services or start groups or different things, is it like a leader among equals type of a thing? Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And it's more based on gifting rather than hierarchy or I'm the boss of you. Um, what, what I find with team leadership that's so beautiful is Paul really lays it out in Ephesians 4 that he says, you know, uh, God gave uh, the apostolic, the prophetic, the evangelistic, the shepherd and the teacher to the church, to the body of Christ, to build itself up. So you have these five different types of leaders. Like if you ask me what I was, um, I would use the word apostolic, but please don't everyone freak out, right? Like I don't have superpowers to write scripture in my spare time. There's no invisible Pope hat over my head. Apostolic just means a sent one, missionary. I'm a missionary. I'm a serial church planner. Um, when you look at like that word apostle, we always think the 12 apostles, but they were called the 12 in the scripture because they were special. They had a special authority nobody else has, right? Um, so when you use that term today, you're speaking about something functional, like what your flavor is. It's not your authority or superpowers. And I, I get really annoyed when people make it that because they're making that up. 
um, Paul saw himself as the last one. He says, last of all, I was like one born out of due time. Paul was the 13th apostle, the apostle of the Gentiles in Galatians 2. So he counted himself in that special bracket. He said, I'm, I was just a little late to the party. But he uses that word in the Greek for Barnabas, Timothy, um, Silvanus. It's used for uh, a great many people. There's nine individuals we know of by name that are called apostles. So, uh, but this just means sent one, missionary. There is no word missionary in the New Testament, except it's apostles, translate apostle, just means missionary. So I'm a missionary. I will start a church. I will plant and move on. Well, then you also have, a. have served with people that are evangelists. I've served with shepherds. They're not expositors in the pulpit, but they disciple. So if I'm planting on a team like that, it's like a multidisciplinary team, right? It'd be like if you're in the medical profession, you know, uh, you've got your x-ray tech, you've got your RN, you've got your doctor, you've got your med nurse, you got your, you know, you got all these different people, your respiratory therapist, your physical therapist, everybody has a specialty. And on a multidisciplinary team like that, um, I'm not a great shepherd. So I rely heavily on shepherds. And there's a lot more dynamics between those. They play off each other in different ways. And we map that out in plantology as well. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, you, you talk about the apest uh, a ton in uh, throughout throughout your book. And, um, you know, just as you as you develop some of those different types of things, just if you could, because I know there's a chapter in there just talking about the gifts and, and unlocking the gifts with uh, from among your people and along your your launch team in particular, uh, so that you can go out and do the ministry that that God's kind of designed everybody to do. Uh, if you could just kind of speak into some of the gifting, and I know you have like uh, some really cool exercises to help just kind of uncover this from different people. Uh, but what is what does that apest kind of look like? Well, I believe that um, the apest is put on, you know, each one of us has like, it's Christ, right? It was Christ's five functions. He was the apost the apostle uh, and forerunner according to Hebrews 4. He was the prophet Moses spoke about. He was an evangelist preaching the good news, good news of the kingdom, repent for the kingdom is at hand. He was uh, the good shepherd. And lastly, lastly he said, uh, uh, call no man teacher or rabboni. He was the teacher rabboni. So uh, Jesus was all five of those. But when it says he ascended, he left this Jesus shaped hole in the world that it says in Ephesians 4, the church is meant to fill, take his ministry that he left unfinished because there's the finished work of Christ which is what he did on the cross and through the resurrection, the death and resurrection. But the, the ministry of Jesus to fill the world with himself is not done yet. To fill the world with his glory was given to the church. Sorry, it's some deep theology for a, a Thursday afternoon. But the way he does that is by sharing his ministry, just like he did with the 12, he shares it with us. So each believer has these in him. So, so when you have an evangelist pulling on you and he's like, come on, Andrew, let's go. And you're like, no, I don't want to. It's because that part of Jesus's ministry is being developed in you by one of these types of leaders. And I believe all of us have all five in us. Um, but we have some of us like, I'm, I'm just going to excel at one and not at, at, in another. And I think all of us have our gift set and gift mix. And then of course, there's a bunch more gifts in the Bible that um, talk about that. But how we often help people find their gifts is we will take a local paper. In this case today, maybe you'd use the internet, you know, hey, Google your town and know the biggest challenges of the city council or whatever, um, you know, biggest community problems and you Google it or whatever. But we just take newspapers. We set people around in small groups on our big day where we'd be like, praying like for the community and this is all leading up to when we actually planted the church but um we would put those papers down and we would say hey i want you to take a black sharpie circle all the needs in the city they would and then we'd come back and say right now you got a red sharpie on your table circle one because they might have circled 30 needs in black in that paper and then we say circle one in red and when you do we're just going to ask you, you know, if, if that one in red represents the one thing we as a church plant could do, if there were only one thing we we're going to do, what would that be? So they go start circling. And then when we let them share, they start to get up and they say, oh, kids aging out of foster care. And then they start to cry. They start to weep. The, the emotion starts to come out. The passion starts to come. The burden starts to come. 
And what we have noticed over the years is the reason that is, is that people are usually passionate about what they're burdened for, right? And so we use their burdens to see what their gifts are, because normally what people are passionate about, they're gifted in. So we kind of reverse engineer. We start with their burden, we watch their passion come out, and then you see this willingness, but also a gifting for them to say, um, like if they say, uh, you know, I think we ought to uh, go feed the poor, or I think we ought to um, give uh, socks to the poor. I lived homeless, one lady said once. She said, I was homeless for a year. Oh, socks are so hard. You run, you run through socks so fast. And so we listen. And meanwhile, we were over here saying, now, now you hear people talking about microchurch, but we we're creating a gift affinity. These people are all gifted in this. This is going to tie into a mission that this group here needs to be on during our church plant. So we would call it gift driven mission. We never knew until we found out what people's gifts are, what direction the church was going to take on mission. That's really interesting because you, uh, I mean, it feels like at some point you're almost abdicating your, your vision of your church. Um, is that, is that not necessarily the case or are you just utilizing just the, the unique nature of what God's brought to you? Well, to... God, God forbid, that's a great question. God forbid the day that God gives the vision to me as the senior leader, because, uh, that would be a, you know, Peyton sized vision. But if, if, if I have Christ's vision and I, and I look at it as who has the Holy spirit divinely, like the Holy spirit has a vision. And if I come in there with a vision and tell everybody, look, I'm really passionate about this and this is what we're going to do. And they put that square shaped peg in a round hole. It, I can force people into that. They become volunteers instead of passionate missionaries on mission. I want passionate missionaries on mission who are going to go after what God has already gifted them for. And they're super burdened and super passionate about. And so it's not abdicating because what I'm called to do in that Ephesians 4 passage is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So in doing that, yes, I mean, I'm taking less of a Luke Skywalker role and I'm taking more of an Obi-Wan Kenobi role and I'm training Luke's to go out there and use the force. So, and that's what I wanna do, right? I'm in ministry to make disciples. I'm in ministry to, to see people. So it's a different way of thinking about it. But if I'm trying to get everybody to do what I think they should do, rather than getting them to listen to what the Holy Spirit's already put in their heart, then I feel like I'm not serving them well. Because when you can activate a group of people into missionaries, you've changed the game. I mean, you've literally, every Sunday morning, every pastor standing up there at the podium trying to get the uh, people in the church that sit there week after week as an audience, he's trying to mobilize them into missionaries and to active participants. But the whole thing is set up to be an audience. So the trick becomes, how do I hotwire this thing from day one in planting to make it about mission for them, right? Rather than me up here trying to get them to do mission, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit different. Think of it as like a, a conductor, right? You could say the, the orchestral conductor has abdicated. He's not playing any instruments, but what he's doing is he's up there and he's He's leading the brass section. Think of that as a mission. He's leading the wind session over here. He's leading the string session over here. He's leading all these sections at the same time. And what he's trying to do is mobilize them and unify them to all kind of accomplish that same mission. And he's vital, but he's not picking up an instrument. That's a fantastic illustration i love that man it just came i need to write it down oh, there, yeah let me get a pen man. Uh, that was so good. um yeah you uh no that's good so you you mentioned uh either before we started or or, or right after just the, the the thing that you're you're getting ready to start another church uh so you're there in san diego getting ready to to launch another church what what will that process just early on kind of look like <clears throat> Start to attract people that are interested in what you're doing. So what will that attraction look like for you? Because you mentioned just not necessarily like marketing type stuff, but what is, mm -hmm. how do you basically build your your core team? Um, and then also, I know that you're you're going to run church a little bit differently than most. 
if you could just kind of take us into what that will practically look like for as far yeah. as weekly gatherings and the Sunday gatherings and, and those type of things. So uh, thanks for asking that. Um, tonight, it's really interesting because I mentioned the Obi-Wan Luke Skywalker thing. I'll be taking a little bit more of, a, of an Obi-Wan role to uh, a guy I trained back in 2015 who's on his second church plant. He'll be planting, um, actually, this is third church plant. He'll be planting, um, you know, we'll be a team, but I, I told him I don't want to lead the team. Um, I will kind of take more of a back seat. I'll be there, but you're going to be the one, you know, confront Vader. I'm there as Obi Wan. I might flick some switches over on the power generator over here, but um, that's about it. And so, you know, and obviously I'll be on mission. Missional catalyzing is, is kind of what apostolics do. You can't help it. But it's really interesting planning with a shepherd. He's a shepherd. So he's gathering a bunch of people together. Um, you know, and throughout the summer, his vision was, let's just get together and just hang out. And I actually wrote a, a blog about this today on uh, newbreedtraining.com, where I actually say this is a little different. But I do believe <clears throat> in a post-COVID world that things have changed. The game has changed. I actually believe that right now for us in a post-COVID world, what we're looking at is people are collectively tired. So like I, I kind of dictate the the problems that we had with the missional movement where all of a sudden it, it was this ideology, we're going to do life together, but life got in the way of doing life together. And when it did, you either doubled down on your ideal and, and got a little legalistic and weird and funny about it. Like, hey, man, we're supposed to be a community. Hey, man, we're supposed to be a family. And and it was like calling people to family meeting, but it, it started to feel coerced and forced and it started to feel unnatural. And, um, and for me, nothing I've ever done has ever been like, you will come to this. And to me, I've always been laissez-faire, like just let the Holy Spirit do his thing. But that was the problem with that. And, I, and so I give this warning in this article, if you're doing micro church or community based or whatever it is, and you in any way get into a position where you're laying more burdens on people, you have to understand the collective psyche of everyone globally, not just in America, is exhaustion. Right, that is the collective move. Everybody's exhausted. People worn out. Addictions at an all-time high. Right, cynicism is on the rise. People are just—they're worn out. The the pandemic really gave everybody a little bit of PTSD, and so I think it's really interesting that going forward we got a shepherd who's going to be leading the team because I believe right now the mission, the missional intersect between the mission front and the mission itself, is soul care. I believe that is where we will reach the world. And if you break down the Great Commission, the Great Commission is actually about soul care. It's actually uh, go make disciples. What's what's making a disciple? Pouring into somebody, right? So rather than hey, come to my life on life community meeting and barbecue and let's you know eat meals together. And when it's a low night, you don't go beat up on everyone. You you step back and say, well, maybe they're struggling. Maybe maybe they need some love, you know, and you. You just double down on pouring into people. It's a totally different way of approaching it and looking at it. So um, I'll, I'll tell a story real quick. Um, this came home to me very powerfully years and years ago, um, very long ago. I remember um, a couple that had stopped coming. They, they didn't come for about six weeks. And in Wales, you know, churches are small. We're a pretty tight group. And I think we got up to about 120, which would be considered mega church in Wales, right? Um, but <laughs> I remember this couple didn't come and, and finally I stopped by their house and deep inside, like I was a little like annoyed, like, Hey, what's wrong with these people? Don't come to church. And, uh, and when I, when I knocked on the door, the guy answered and he said, Oh, Peyton, I'm so glad you're here. He said, uh, we've been going through it so bad. He's like, you know, my wife, um, sometimes she has a hard time getting out of bed. He said, we, we didn't share this with anyone, but uh, my wife was pregnant. We had a miscarriage and um, brothers just, it, it feels like a death in the family. And it just, it ripped our hearts out. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so petty. I was, I was annoyed and upset with you because you didn't come to church. And, you know, the Lord is just like, hey, hey, your job is to pour in these poor people. And that stuck with me, to be honest. That was, I feel like those six weeks of getting all cheesed off 
we're like my son's a thunder moment like where god's just like i'm just gonna get you to laugh at yourself you know a little bit here but i mean i would have laughed if it weren't sad but i think again it goes back to that idea of we're looking when we're building crowds and all that we're looking at it wrong we're looking at what they can do to build our thing now, there's been three different times um, in the last 20 years where people flock back to church 9 11 the passion of the christ film and the pandemic those three times people flock back into church you know what they did they came in they needed answers they needed soul care they were scared or they were confused or they were and you know what happened they looked around and said well i ain't gonna get it here because all the pastors got real excited whoa the numbers you know like they were more excited about how the people made them look that they all of a sudden it swole their numbers up and the problem is um those people picked up on that i asked the question in my first book church zero um which is about going back to ground zero with the Holy Spirit in your church. Um, people made this assessment quickly. Are you for me? Are you for God? Or are you for yourself? And I think they made up their minds pretty quick. Yeah, that's good. No, I, yeah, I think uh, the the APES, I was first kind of introduced to that when I when I read Church Zero uh, several years ago when we were oh. Um, you're a church zero child that's yeah, that's yeah, great I mean, you're a survivor I, I read church zero and survive you need like a t-shirt that's right <laughs> <laughs> something like that no, so you um uh, yeah you talked about just the the dynamics of some of the apex leadership and what your role is going to be in your in your church moving forward and that the shepherd's mm -hmm. going to be kind of taking a lead role what then does what what does the gathering look like for you guys uh whether it's six months from now or <clears> you know what what will that look well, like <clears throat> I am a big believer in Sundays. Um, it, you'll hear a lot of people from, you know, the missional front that that poo poo Sundays. They think if you don't meet on a on a Sunday at nine in the morning or ten in the morning or eleven in the morning, it automatically makes you missional, makes you unique and, and edgy. I don't subscribe to that. I actually, I've never ever met a non believer who did not expect church to meet on a Sunday morning. Like that's when they tell you they'll come to church. Like what time Sunday? They're, they're, they're ready for that. And I think it's a cultural expectation, a cultural norm. I had no problem feeding into that cultural norm. I mean, Jesus still attended the Passover at the appointed time. Um, so I have no problem with, you know, kind of saying, well, gosh, Sundays are, I mean, you read people say, oh yeah, it could happen any day. It could, um, it doesn't have to. And doing it on any other day doesn't really make it more or less missional. So I keep it to Sunday because it's simple. I keep it to Sunday so I don't have to explain to people and go, well, you know, you could worship on any day. You know, I just, that's weird to an unbeliever. They don't care about all that, you know? So um, for me, I keep it Sunday morning. Um, our gatherings, um, the one thing that I am always kind of keen on when we gather is uh, we do have some worship. In fact, I have a tool. <laughs> I have a tool called Crafting Your Missional APES Liturgy. Um, church planning is a time where you can really think, what is the stuff in the scripture we don't do that we probably should? Like everybody has what I call the evangelical, excuse me, evangelical bow tie. The 30 minutes of singing on one and a little nod of announcements and then the 30 minutes message on the other and it's like a little bow tie for your service. But, um, or you got the hymn sandwich, right? Like opening prayer, uh, song, uh, scripture reading, song, announcement, song, sermon, song, benediction, song, you know. Uh, and, and that's a him sandwich, like a Scooby snack, you, you know, squish it down for me. I'm looking at what's going to best serve these people. How are they going to get discipled, right? That's shepherding. How are they going to get in touch with the, the presence and power of God? That's the prophetic. How are they going to be, uh, on mission either right then or somewhere else? So I look at, at the apostolic, um, how are they going to get romance and wooed by the gospel? That's the evangelistic. And how are they going to be taught, right? To go deeper into the things the word and the wisdom of God, those things all matter. And the evangelical bow tie is not going to do it. So I like to craft a missional APES gathering. And to be honest, I know this isn't the answer that, that you're looking for, but I'm actually, I don't know yet until I know a little bit more about the mission. Now we're starting to identify our mission, which has to do with a community garden, which is connected to the library. A book just came out called Overdue. Uh, which talks about um, the libraries being the hub of the community. 
Um, so we are uh, probably going to do something there around the library and around this community garden. But that said, the actual gathering, I don't know. One thing we always do, though, is we always do interaction. So we don't sit in rows in any church I've ever planted. We sit in half circles with maybe like a little, you know, knack Ikea table uh, for like coffee and, you know, donuts or whatever. And then we have discussion. So the message might be, it might be a normal size message. It might be a 10 minute message with, you know, 10 minutes of discussion. It might be 10 more minutes after that of, of teaching and then 10 more minutes of discussion. We might have someone sing at that point. We don't know yet, but you know, we tend to look at things like prayer. When does that happen? Well, because we're sitting in small groups, people can pray for each other, right? At some point during that, um, because we're, uh, sitting there and there's a table right in front of you. We can do communion every week, right? It doesn't have to be this quick rush thing attached to the end of the service. It kind of deserves more than that, right? So we we give our people time. And by the way, our service goes longer. But one thing that I've always noticed with non-believers or people searching for God or even new believers, an hour is not enough for them, right? So we we go longer. Yeah, that's awesome. You you mentioned um, in in your book, and, and and there's so many just like disciple making movement books that you just you, you read about it theoretically, or even you know practically, it makes sense of you know you train these people, and then they split off and they start another group, and you train these people, and they split off and they start another group, or um, all these different things of just the actual multiplication of churches and groups. Uh, have you have you seen that um, through through your model of ministry or through your um, just experience and with with your new breed planters and different things because i know that it's just innate and built in with the the desire of the apes teams and once you help form some of those teams and sending them out um and just the snowball just like getting it rolling and just making a huge kingdom impact um but yeah. do you have practical stories of you know just how how some of that multiplication has happened yeah so what we typically do is every small group or what you would call micro church um think of it as another core team you know our launch team right in in development in utero um i think i see those as church planning incubators so at the very beginning um i just start training them to to lead a, a missional cog we call them cogs communities of grace so they've got a shared mission it won't be like the other cogs shared mission um and then they do all the things I was just talking about. They'll, they'll pray, they'll take communion, they'll discuss, they'll do all that in the week. We gather together to do mission on Sundays, but um, the, the, those groups might have like a focus, like one might be an Xbox competition back in you know the, 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 the new millennium, that was a big deal, right? 2005, six, uh, Master Chief was the hotness, right? So that's what they did. We did cooking classes for single unwed mothers. We did um, film critics club. We did reading groups. You know, I mean, we had planted our church on the back of a Dan Brown Da Vinci Code reading group in the middle of Starbucks. Fifty people, uh, you know, non-believers started coming to that. So we're like, well, we got a church plant here. And uh, so what we did is we just, you know, eventually I would end up spilling the spilling the beans that hey, you've actually been leading a church. And you've dealt with almost every pastoral issue you could. And, um, you know, and that, and that became accidental at first. And then it, it, it then became intentional. And now that is how, as we have these, all these old groups all over, those eventually become church plants. And so if you can be intentional about training up other leaders, you, you can multiply quite quickly. Yeah, uh, kind of, kind of along that vein. I mean, you mentioned that that you've done this multiple times of of start of the church and left and start of the church and left, and and you, I think you even mentioned that the the shepherd that you're working with right now is is this his third or fourth church third, plant? Yeah, third church third. plant. Um, can you just talk for a second about? what is it about some of those because because you even mentioned in your book you know in, in in acts like the professionals weren't actually the ones that planted and stayed the professionals were the ones that left after right. they planted and stuff like that can you just share some of the tension of should i stay should i go um <laughs> the clash planters just just all of that yeah you, you just quoted one of my one of my favorite bands ever the clash joe strummer <laughs> Should I stay or should I go? That is the question. Um, you know, we see a model of both. You know, we see James is the one who stays in Jerusalem. Peter moves out to hit the dispersia. 
and Paul goes out to reach the Gentiles. So you see all these different models um, of apostolic ministry. It's not one size fits all, but um, for me, you know, I would have a sell by date every like three years. I would, <laughs> I'd have to move. And I remember just thinking I'm broken. I have attachment disorder, you know, um, <laughs> in ministry. But then I realized, wait a second, I think I get things catalyzed and then I move on. Like I, it started to hit me. And I actually, when we were doing the Starbucks thing, somebody said, Peyton, he was a, a New Testament uh, professor at the seminary. He came to one of our Da Vinci Code groups to, to speak into it. Um, and he said, Peyton, um, you're apostolic. And at that time I said, oh, my theology doesn't allow me to believe, because I thought he was trying to say I have superpowers. And I was like, oh, my theology won't allow for that, which still doesn't. But, um, but anyways, uh, he was saying, look, you know, you, 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 you catalyze. And he, he went on, he said, man, you know, what was John Wesley? You know, he wasn't a pastor, right? I'm like, oh, he said, you know, George Whitfield wasn't a pastor. You knew that, right? Oh, Martin Luther, not a pastor. You knew that, right? Oh, so he's just started going through church history and showing all these people that catalyze things. And he said, they weren't pastors, Peyton. Um, they were something else. And that got me thinking, because I love church history. So, and in fact, if you read church plantology, it's filled with church history. So um, where, where we see these things, these patterns reemerging, whenever there's kingdom expansion, it's like we've rediscovered these things. And so you, you asked about, you know, what does that movement look like? Well, for me, um, because it's all hinged on team, I can leave. There's always a team in place. And that's what Paul did. He raised up a team of elders, raised up a, a, a team of elders, deacons, stabilized it, and then left, right? And sometimes um, when he didn't leave people behind from his team, it went wrong. Like his first missionary journey created the Galatians, right? And so he never makes that mistake again. I talked about Paul's learning curve. In his second missionary journey, he actually starts leaving people behind intentionally, who can get the the um, churches stabilized so he can move on. But then he moves on. He picks up new people, right? Like he picks up Timothy in Lister and Derby and goes, come on, let's go to Iconium. So he starts picking them up. And then he deposits Timothy later and goes, okay, now your turn. So there's this constant leapfrog of picking people up and dropping them off a couple churches down the road as he's training them. They're watching him. And like I said, the, the number one key to multiplication is leadership development. The number one bottleneck to church multiplication is leadership development or the leadership pipeline. If you bottleneck on leadership pipeline, you bottleneck on multiplication. If your leadership pipeline is flowing, your multiplication flows. And that's why I believe Jesus spent three years doubling down and focusing on training 12. Uh, it's interesting you say that we actually just had Mac Lake come in and do a- He's my mentor. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I serve with Mac. He he trained me how to train, believe it or not. That's awesome. Yeah, he came in. Uh, we had an event back in March, and he's, he spent a full day with us just training us through some of the... Yeah, Mac is a genius. I, I got it because he is like my Obi-Wan. He's my Yoda. If, if I'm in an Obi-Wan, he's my Yoda. Mac Lake is the bomb. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, and that was, I mean, it's been a huge, a huge heartbeat of ours for a long time of just, you know, and, and even identifying like, where, where do future church planters come from, right? So that's been, you know, one of the, the kind of the unicorn issues for all of church planting organizations yeah. is that we have resources on resources on resources to go send people out, we just don't have people to send out. Um, and that's, you know, the case with Nexus as well. And so, and, and especially in a post COVID type of a situation where churches are closing and buildings are available and all these different things, you know, um, just I, can I speak into that? Cause, um, in, in reaching the unreached, uh, in that book, I, I give my biggest takeaway. I think every time you plant, you learn some, some powerful things that you didn't know before. Right. So we talk about Paul's learning curve. This is Peyton's learning curve. So I was in Long Beach. I remember I was baptizing. It was the last baptism that I did there. And our, our baptisms were usually powerful because they would all bring their people and then their people would get saved. And then we just have to do another baptism. We baptize people right then. But um, I remember uh, this guy coming up out of the water and he had this um, really perverted um, tattoo 
on his back of a succubus and um, it was like really filthy. And I remember just looking at him, the Lord just spoke to me like, that's your next church planner right there. And, and I remember thinking, well, that guy's been in prison 18 years, you know, on and off. I don't, I don't know about him. And, and I felt the Lord just really press on me that if you disciple any one of these people in front of you, they will become leaders. And, and I started, you know, like, I'm not one of these guys where God talks to me all the time. Um, not a weirdo, but I felt that was really the Lord because I looked around and I was like, you know what? You're right. Because it's team. It's not star players. When you're in star players, you, you look for the person, read theology books, you do this. That's not what Jesus did, right? Jesus took a team and he picked people you and I would have never put on our teams. Our denominations, our mission boards would have, I got in trouble once back when I was training with Mac Lake for writing a blog that said uh, the 12 would not have passed any missions boards assessments, right? They just wouldn't have. And, and that makes you think like, oh, so what did Jesus model for us? Jesus, Jesus modeled that if you took 12 knuckleheads that no one else put stock in. I mean, John, maybe, right? John and Andrew, maybe. Um, the rest, no. But if you took those t- other 10 knuckleheads and you poured into them, leadership emerged. So I began to realize that if all a leader is, is somebody who's been discipled very well. Okay, there's some people out there that um, they had to disciple themselves. They got a hold of books from dead people or they got around someone and begged someone to pour into them or what have you. That's usually what makes a leader. And if you read the New Testament, right, um, when Paul's talking about elders and deacons, it follows that same language. Paul tells Timothy, hey, before you leave Ephesus, I need you to appoint, you got to replace these false teacher elders, you got to put elders in, look for this, and then appoint them. Same with deacons, appoint them. Leaders are appointed, right? Especially team leadership. You appoint them, you look for character, you look for things in their life, and you appoint, you ask them, hey, can you do this? Yes, I'll do this. But we make it this big, like, I had this mystical calling and this forest clearing with, you know, okay, I understand, like, there is, like, a divine calling, but it's used exclusively of apostolic ministry, believe it or not. Um, It's actually just used for missionaries, people that actually leave and go somewhere. So uh, we don't typically have that mystical calling to, to leave your nets um, for elders and deacons. Those are the church's leaders. They don't need that. And so I, I personally think we have to rethink leadership altogether. We have the leaders there. We have the planters there. We're just not treating them like future planners and leaders. If we did, if we saw them that way, and started from there and started pouring into them and discipling them, we would have them. Right. No. And that's been, you know, a lot of our, our, our heartbeat is just, you know, the most of our upcoming church planters are going to be sitting in the pews on Sunday. Right. I mean, of just yeah. kind of understanding who they are and, and helping them just develop into those type of things. So, yeah. um, can you talk into maybe what, what is, what is the tension? Like when you, when you do leave, how, how do you leave? Well, like when you're when you're leaving as a as an apostolic and, and yeah. you set up a team and all these different things and you know it's almost like Paul leaving Ephesus type of a thing where everybody's just broken hearted but they understand why like how how do you get to that point? Yeah, and you know, Andrew, I want to say your questions are phenomenal. Like you're you're a good interviewer, brother, because these some of these questions are so well thought out, man. Like kind of kind of um, floored by them, but uh, to be honest. Um, I don't, I don't always leave well. I wish I did. I mean, I've made tons of mistakes um, when I've left churches. Uh, in fact, it's the hardest thing about apostolic ministries. Look back and go, ooh, I kind of failed those people a little bit. And, and I know Paul felt that with the Galatians, right? Like I know he, um, he even says, I, I wonder if I wasted my time concerning you. But then he goes back and he says, let us strengthen what's weak. Right. That's that sounds really good and positive. But Paul Minute, like, hey, these guys are dying. We sucked. <laughs> we got to go fix our problems. It wasn't a positive like, oh, wow. You know, wow, they really strengthen things. That's that's a how encouraging. Um, but w- what what often I missed was something that 
I had to learn and I learned it from Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he raises from the dead, he spends, uh, you know, what is it, 40 days with them, teaching them and explaining to them. And I would say retraining them. That's what he's doing because he's getting ready to ascend. And, and this is why that's so important. When you start off, let's say you plant and three years, five years later, you move on. When you first get there, that's when you're pumping them full of vision and, you know, kind of challenging, like, you're going to see these things and you're telling them all that. Okay, number one, the first half of what, what you're saying, they don't believe. So 50% of what you're saying, you're going to see people set free from possession. You're going to see miracles. You're going to say the more front line you go, the more of that you see. That's, that's what I lay down in reaching the unreach. Um, but they don't believe it. You're telling them you're going to see this. They don't believe it. So 50% goes, you know, right, right in one ear, right out there, just right over their heads. So now you got 50% of what you've been teaching those same people that you're going to leave in three years. The second half of what you're teaching in the beginning, they don't understand because they haven't experienced it. So 50% of that, so 25% now, right? Because they have no context. They don't even know what you're talking about. You're using these catchphrases. It works like this in ministry. And they're like 101 and you're at 501, right? So they don't get it, right? They don't even understand the Bible. So now 25% of what you've taught them, um, when you leave, you think they get it all. And what it is, is they've experienced now what you taught, but they don't have the principles. So during those 40 years, you've got to go back and reach Hey, all that stuff you experienced guys for three years, let me explain the why behind the what now. Let me go back and teach you the theology of this or the principles of this. Let me explain to you what it was because you didn't pay attention at the very beginning of what I was saying because you didn't believe me and you didn't understand it. So then you go back after the experience. And I learned that the hard way because people would like do the same practices without understanding any of the heart behind it or the principles. And that was kind of a disaster. So I know we're out of time, but um, hopefully that helps a bit. They, you got to retrain your team just as hard when you leave them as when you started with them. Yeah, no, bro, I, I really appreciate you just taking some time for us. I mean, there's a there's a boatload of content that we could spend all day and probably all all year unpacking and in, in different contexts. But um, I really appreciate you taking some time for us, man. So thank you so much for just the work that you continue to do, the 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 writings that you continue to offer and just so many different things for 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 church planters and ministry. Thanks so much, Andrew. And uh, if you guys do want to track with us at newbreedtraining.com. Definitely head on over there and uh, you can get the first chapter that Andrew is talking about of Church Plantology. It's a free download, so you can read it for free. Awesome. Yeah. So ways you can connect, like there's the Church Planter podcast, uh, the Team Leadership podcast and different different things. Is there yeah. other, other, other avenues people can connect? Uh, I got so, uh, unfortunately, I have a bunch of stupid shows out there, but Team Leadership podcast is the current one. And then just for your people to know, um, over at NewBreedTraining.com, about every three months we drop a free course and then every month we drop a free tool and we had a course on character that's gated behind our membership but we have like a dashboard tool for that that everyone can have for free and it's usually gain, uh, gauged towards you and your team so if you take these tools or whatever it might be something you can take your team your leadership team through we always like to give you a tool that you can kind of you know work with your team team's important so Awesome. Well, dude, thank you again for, for your time and uh, just for blessing us for the last hour or so. Thanks for having me, Andrew. It was a blast, man. Appreciate I look forward it. to seeing you again. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Thanks.